Our guest in this segment is Senator Jason Barrett. JB, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I need to apologize first for uh, my lack of appearances during session. Uh, it was very difficult the last 30 days or so to to get away from our, our morning caucus that we have every morning. So I, I apologize for not being on as much as I would like to have uh, during the session. I thought you were going to apologize for coming in without food. I did too, That's yeah. really where and, I thought you were going with this. It, an apology would have gone a long way without any biscuits the, this the morning. The food would have gone a longer way. It would have been. Right. And better received than an apology. <laughs> Maybe He's, next time. I did bring. Time. I brought biscuits last time I was here. You did. Yeah. They were delicious too. By the way, how's Thank business? You. Good. Good. It, everything went really well while I was gone for sixty days. Thankfully, the staff and managers there did an excellent job. So. That's got to be a relief. It was. Well, yeah. congratulations to you on a well-trained staff. Thank you. Yeah. What What's proven to be the biggest selling sandwich? Um, the Mary B, which is uh, bacon, egg, and uh, cheese. Oh, you can see why. Those are the three basic staples of life. Yeah. Now, yeah, why, why the name? What's what's move? Uh, so the Tudors folks, um, however many years ago, I don't, I don't know how many, uh, they came up with these names, and they were naming naming them after uh, different people. And I think Mary B is somebody who was, I don't think she was a customer. I think she was somebody maybe in the Tudor family. Okay. I'm not sure of that. But uh, t one example I can give you is the Ron, which is sausage, egg, and cheese. There was a gentleman that came in, ordered, his name was Ron. He ordered, he was one of the very first customers uh, of a Tudor's, and he ordered that just about every day. And so they named it after him. Okay. So I don't think there's a lot of um, rhyme or reason as to where these names came from, but they, they, they're they there and they stuck. So, so they're not your names. They're the they're names not. that you inherited from today. That's exactly yeah. right. Okay. Dylan, you had something. It's, it's kind of changed my life a little bit to have a Tudor's Biscuit World about 10 minutes from my house. Whoever decided to put a hash brown on a sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit, the thundering herd. Genius. I, I want to shake that. I want to shake their hand. Yeah, that, that's just like what Permani does in Pittsburgh. You yeah, put, with French fries. Put right? the French fries yeah. on the sandwich, yeah. So, so, it's a potato product. It all works. So yeah. not only does he not bring food. Then we spent a lot of time talking about food. That's not my idea. <laughs> you have to blame the host for that, John. I, did, I didn't that. bring that up. That's, that's all on me. All right, let's let's talk uh, legislative session here. And um, sure. I'm not sure what the governor is going to sign and what he signed over the weekend. I didn't read anything about signatures, but is there anything you're, that was passed that you're expecting he won't sign? That's a good question. It's not really one that I have given um, much or any thought to. I, I, I don't recall any legislation... Uh, that we were working on that we passed where the governor's office expressed um, any concern over or um, there was any talk or threat of veto. So there, there's nothing that comes to my mind that, that the governor uh, would veto or, or, or would consider veto. Um, if I, w I would say this, that again, I haven't heard it. And if it's something that he does veto, it's maybe something on uh, on a technical error or some other issue like that. I don't know that, that there's a policy reason um, that he would veto anything simply because there was no communication, at least that I'm aware of, uh, that would indicate a veto of any legislation. There was some uh, an article that he was giving a lot of thought about the vaccination uh, You're right. bill. And the last year, we know he vetoed the SSAC bill that uh, had been sent to him. And uh, I understand that there was also the funding for WVU and the research the doctor who was featured on 60 Minutes was doing with drug addiction and Alzheimer's. Uh, with, he was a neurologist there. You're right. The, the vaccine bill did slip my mind when you asked the question. And that's one that I think he's he's indicated that he's um, – considering vetoing or hasn't maybe, maybe back up that I don't know that he's made his mind up I think is, is kind of how he's um, uh, indicated where he is on the bill uh, the the two million dollars to WVU is is puzzling to me and I think puzzling to to other members of the legislature and I haven't heard justification uh, there's a doctor there that's been uh, working on uh, I think Alzheimer's treatment uh, drug addiction um, and that was a $2 million appropriation to WVU for, for that doctor to continue his work. So um, that was one that we talked about in caucus, I, I believe, fairly early on in the session. There, there was no discussion uh, as to any concerns with that. I mean, that, that is something that um, you would think a $2 million investment from the state on those two important issues, those health-related issues, um, I, I don't know. the. Re I, I would, I'm very interested in knowing what the justification for that veto is. I, I have not heard. Well, especially when you send, what was it, uh, 8 or $10 million to Marshall for a baseball stadium. Yeah. And, and also, I'd argue that, isn't it? 
and also there's going to be so much federal dollars coming in. The $2 million would be just kind of a token, let's buy and we're supportive of it. I would think it'd be a no-brainer for the uh, governor to sign that bill and because it's it's going to be the, uh, the standard barrier and put West Virginia on the map, at least in the medical field. Well, this guy's already a leader in his field in yeah. the world, and he's right here in this state in Morgantown. And phenomenal uh, visibility. And, and chose to come months. here, by the way. Yeah, that's right, yeah. From where he was before. Yeah, so I, I would think that'd be a non non uh, uh uh, a non-brainer and again he's getting the most of his money th- th- through the feds I wanna, the federal government i want to congratulate you on a new malaprop bill between a non-starter <laughs> and a no-brainer you got a non-brainer in there i like that i'm gonna start breaking these ones down because yeah, you got a good one every day <laughs> and we have we have gill scrap while they're taking notes <laughs> <laughs> jason what did you get passed this year out of your own uh list of bills you sponsored just real quick i don't think we're going to see non-brainer and john gill straps next <laughs> <laughs> you don't think they'll be in there i don't the think non-brainer? Be in there. i like that um, um, I worked on a, on several things, and um, one of them that we have talked about on this show, uh, at least when I was able to join during the session, was uh, how we or how county commissions make appointments uh, for county commission vacancies. And that bill, Senate Bill 542, did pass. Uh, the effective date uh, when it went to the House of Delegates was pushed out to January 1st, 2025, um, and just quickly. Um, the what the bill does it, it requires that a county commissioner uh, that when the vacancy is filled in a county commission that that individual has to come from an open magisterial district um, you will not the, the county commissions now will no longer be able to appoint someone from a magisterial district that's already represented by another commissioner that's the law as it as it relates to an election but that is not the law currently uh, as it relates to an appointment uh, so we just matches those up the other thing that it does is requires in the event that the county commission cannot um, make come to an agreement on the replacement and the the executive committee uh, gives a list of five now uh, for five member commissions gives a list of five uh, to the commission then they're able to choose one off of that five if they cannot make an agreement then then the striking process begins and the striking process is already in play in current law but but Again, this is with a, with uh, a list of five names. Uh, each commissioner will get a strike. Uh, it will start with party affiliation of the vacancy that is being filled. Uh, then it will go to tenure. Uh, so it's just a, a little different way of doing it. But I think it clears up. Um, and this and this in no way deals with the issue in Jefferson County, um, with the exception of what do you do in the instance where. Uh, commissioners are tied in tenure and that was an issue in Jefferson County when there were three names there were uh, the the commissioner tab uh, had the most tenure so she was able to strike first and then there was a tie in tenure between Steve Stolliper and Trisha Jackson and um, Steve Stolliper deferred to Trisha Jackson so what this bill fixes really wasn't an issue in Jefferson County it could have been had Steve Stolliper not deferred um, his ability to strike to Commissioner Jackson. So how does this solve the tie when tenure is a tie? Well, first it starts with political party. Right. Uh, and then it goes to tenure. And if there is a tie, it's a simple draw. Simple draw, uh, okay. Which, and everybody says, well, why did you do it that? The House of Delegates and the Judiciary Committee, I'm just to give you an example how silly things can be, um, especially in the House at times. They tried to amend the bill to have a 100-yard foot race. Or hundred meter, hundred yard foot race. The old hundred yard. Yeah, yeah, this is, and I had to go to that committee and explain the bill, and that's the kind of thing I had to waste my time with that day was to listen to them argue about whether a foot race should decide the the, um, the tie. Uh, but anyhow, you mean literally a foot race? Yeah, they actually put that in there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's what I had to deal with. Um, you don't miss the house, do you? Jason? Not at all. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, now I kind of lost my train of thought. In regards to the tiebreaker, yeah. And so, and it's my understanding that, and that was the suggestion from from the Secretary of State's office. And it's my understanding that if we have an election right now, and it comes to it comes down to a tie, you've done all the recount, you've done everything, and it's still tie. Um, it's a coin toss or a draw at that point. Uh, so this is no different. And again, this doesn't say that one commissioner gets to make a strike and the other one doesn't. It just helps to determine the order in which they strike. Well, and, and I think it makes a couple of key changes. In the Jefferson County situation, you had Commissioner Tab, who had been a Republican and then at that time had become an independent. So if you're replacing a Republican, 
and an independent has the first say on who that is, that seems to go outside of what the party structure meant it to be. Well, and, I, and that was the reason for the party affiliation uh, being uh, getting the first strike is that, you know, let's say that there's a, a one party, uh, let's just say the Republican Party, so it's easier to follow. Uh, the, the vacancy is created by a Republican. The Republican Executive Committee comes a, with a list of five names. Sometimes it's hard to get five names, and, and there's certainly there'll be candidates better than the other. And so do we really want a Democrat or an independent striking the best candidates first? Correct. And, I, and I think that's the issue that, well, I know that's the issue I was trying to, to prevent. One of the things that the House of Delegates did change, and I didn't have any problems with when they got past their silliness of a foot race, uh, was to... <laughs> Uh, change it that it that the vacancy if, if someone is a Republican and they get elected as a Republican in the middle of their term they switch to being a Democrat the position has to be filled by a Republican because that's what the voters chose so yeah. I, I went along with that change because I thought the rest of it was important and you've lived uh, that life well I, I did make a joke about that in the committee uh, but uh, yeah I mean I don't I don't see an issue with that if that's what they wanted to do. Bill? Yeah, Jason, a softball question to start the morning. I appreciate that. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Uh, we've heard from various uh, – the, the session described a lot of different ways. Some of the, some on the Democratic side and some Republicans said it was a do-nothing session. Uh, Mike Height the other day uh, uh, said it started slow, but it ended up being a very productive uh, session. Uh, what is your view of the session? Well, I think Mike Height's assessment of that is, yeah. is, is pretty spot on. And, you know, of course, the Democrats are always going to say that. Um, you know, they have a job to do. And, you know, when you have a three-member caucus in the Senate and 11-member caucus in the House, um, you know, I'm sure that it does get frustrating. Um, and, and they're always going to be adversarial. And, they're you know, they're, it's their job. It's what the minority does, especially when you're in a – um, you know, a super minority like that. But I think you've broken the record for taking the most shots, veiled shots at somebody in like two sentences. That was just artistic. I'm just telling you the truth. I, you know, I haven't been here for a while, Rob. You, you know, give me a, give me a break. Your shots in. Uh, but, you know, I think it's hard to say it was a do-nothing legislature when there was yet another 5% pay raise, which mm -hmm. now I think will be the fifth one off the top of my head, four or five, I, I, I'm not sure which, but so another large pay raise for state employees or another pay raise for state employees. Um, we've on the path now to completely eliminate the state income tax on social security benefits uh, over the next three years. Um, we've been able to now make our unemployment fund uh, solvent, uh, which really was uh, in a, the projections in the next couple of years uh, were really uh, would put that unemployment fund in a, in a dire situation. We were able to do that kind of uh, on the last, well, actually on the last day, and that's something that the Senate has been pushing for a number of years, and there's been some resistance in the House, and we were able to, um, you know, come to, to an agreement, and, and there were a lot of folks that put a lot of time into that bill, especially on the last day, hours and hours negotiating, um, and, and we came to a compromise that, I believe uh, really helps to address the problem. West Virginia has one of the largest, believe it or not, one of the largest unemployment benefits to those that are unemployed. The triggers that were put in place in the legislation in 2009 uh, would have taken uh, our un maximum un unemployment benefit now from 662 uh, to well over $800. And uh, the, that if, if we were to see an uptick in unemployment in the next couple of years, the 20, 2027, 2020. Eight. If we were to see an uptick in unemployment, that fund really would have been drawn down. Those triggers would have continued, um, and we would have been in a situation where employers, uh, their rates for unemployment really would have gone up. That would have, uh, I believe, really hurt um, business to, to help continue to grow, to continue to hire more people. Uh, it would have uh, really set us back um, from where we've where we've come in the past several years to attracting business to West Virginia. So I think that was probably the most or one of the the top five most important bills that, that we were able to get passed and one of the things that it does uh basically the only thing that it does it freezes the uh the employee employment benefit um and then it also uh i think it, it leaves it at 26 weeks we, we we attempted to bring it down to 24 weeks we we attempted in the senate um to to kind of stagger the payments so that in the first four weeks you would receive uh, more money than you would in the second four weeks. You'd receive more in the second than the third and on, on out to 24 weeks. The House just couldn't 
uh, grasp that concept. Uh, unfortunately, um, I think some of them did, um, some of them did not. Uh, 51 of them didn't, and that was the reason why we had to go back to this uh, much more simplistic approach. But again, it does um, it does remove those triggers so that the, the, the fund will be solvent uh, into the future. Uh, Mike Hike, just remember that Jason Barrett just called you simple. No, I think he was one of them that got it. Actually, I, I believe, yeah, he was one of the he was one of the votes for the the Senate plan. So we'll give Mike credit for understanding that, but but some others did not. Mr. So. Gilstrap. So I spent the last couple of years fixing finances, right? We got, mm -hmm. we got good surpluses. We've got rainy day funds. We've made the state more attractive to businesses. Um, we got the opioid settlement kind of taking care of hopefully working towards some of the drug addiction issues. We've still got the huge foster child issues. We still have huge education issues with, if, if we can kind of settle the, the economic issues over here and say, all right, that's taken care of. Moving forward, is it time in future sessions to turn in a more serious way, not that we haven't addressed it before, but to really start targeting these education and foster care issues in a directed way? I don't know what the, the solution is. In fact, I tend to think that it's not money. We're already spending a lot of money. We're not, I don't think we're spending a lot of imagination on on the solutions but it's got to come from the legislature and i'm going to guess that you and your colleagues have had some discussions on this sure we have Where are we going for a number of years and and you know it's easy uh, and i know larry schultz loves to do this on friday morning it's just um constantly complain about the legislature over the, well, the there's false a lack of imagination there too in terms of of, of larry of, schultz you're no right. no in terms of solutions you know it oh. comes down to not spending enough money so, uh, there is another shot. See? Well, that's uh, Larry and our friends. It was all in good fun, Larry. I'm sure he'll respond on Friday. But, um, you know, we have made some changes. And the biggest change that we've made, and I know we've talked about it on the show a number of times, is busting DH DHHR up into three different agencies. And it's going to take a little while um, uh, to get things fleshed out, to 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 really understand uh, where the needs are, what we need to do, and, and I think that we've replaced, um, you know, DHHR Secretary Bill Crouch, who I, who never impressed me, uh, and, and fortunately is no longer at DHHR, and now we have three secretaries, and the one of uh, the Department of Human Services, which handles foster care. Um, you know, there was a, some criticism about, um, you know, not giving more money to DHS. What I would say is that, you know, for the next 12 months or for the 12 months of our fiscal year 25, the legislature, we are there just about every month. We'll be able to see, um, because we've broken down uh, specific line items in DHS's budget, we'll be able to see where they're spending money, where they're not spending money. So the, the easy thing to do would have just been let's just appropriate more money across the board. But I think what we're going to be able to do in the 12 months of that uh, fiscal year is to look to see where money is being sp spent, where money isn't being spent, and if money needs to go into whether it's IDD, whether it's uh, foster care, we'll be able to move money from those line items where the agency isn't spending the money and move it over um, into those areas. But um, I, I really think the answer is uh, for right now that we've we, look we've increased um, the the amount of money that goes to foster families. Uh, I, I think uh, some of our numbers are, are are down a little bit. I don't think that we send as many um, foster kids out to um, uh, out of state placement as we did. I, mean, I think that we're you know moving in the in the right track. This problem wasn't created overnight, and it's not going to be solved overnight. But I really think getting the right people at DHS. I really think breaking those agencies down into three uh, really will show that that. Uh, we're able to get a, a better handle on the solution and, and um, be able to move forward. As far as education is concerned, uh, one, there was a, a survey sent out by teachers unions. Then there was a, a survey sent out really by the state Senate and working with uh, the, the uh, Department of Education to send out questionnaires to find out what teachers uh, what the biggest issues in the classroom was, what was the biggest impediment to education. And the overwhelming answer was school discipline. And and the Senate passed over a couple of discipline bills. I think the, the one that received the most attention uh, was about removing uh, students that with a discipline problem out of the classroom, uh, backing up the teacher when the administration just wants to you know, throw them back in the classroom or the administrator comes and, you know, little Johnny's bad and, and causing uh, is causing a disruption and the rest of the students aren't uh, able to learn uh, because of 
of that student um, acting out. And, and so then the teacher sends them to the principal's office. They sometimes sit there for a, a class or two, and then they're sent right back to the classroom or the, the administrator comes. And as soon as they're in the classroom, then little Johnny's behaving. And the minute he leaves, um, you know, he's disruptive again. And then the whole process starts over. So, um, but that did not pass because of pettiness disagreement between the Senate and the House. I don't know. that You'd have to ask a House member why that one didn't pass. I mean, as much as I'd like to take another shot at him, I don't know that I have. <laughs> I, I don't really know the reason in which they didn't run that um, uh, because, a, a, again, th this was a survey uh, that was completed by teachers all over the state, and it was the number one issue. And, and I, don't, I, I don't think that's hard to understand at all. I think any of, the, of us sitting around this table or, or most parents, if you'd ask what is the – some of the one of the biggest concerns uh, in, in impediments to education, I would think that a lot of them would say um, uh, discipline in the classroom. You, you let the one uh, minute, Bill. Okay, you let the house get off the hook a little bit there, but there was, I thought, personality differences that kept that from passing. You're probably right, and I don't serve on the education committee, so uh, maybe I should know that personality conflict or I should understand why some of the education bills got killed on both sides better than I do, um, but I don't. Fair enough. Mr. Okay. Barrett, we'll have you back again. Okay, yes. Looking forward to it. Bill, were you looking to ask another question? No, because you don't have time. If we, if we, my point is money, money, money. I see Maryland coming in with a vast amount of potential increase in, in uh, teacher salaries. We've got to recognize the. We do recognize. Bill, I'm out of time. I keep okay, trying to tell you, I'm out of sorry, time. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought you said it hadn't for one. Sorry. I did. It was a minute ago. I said you had one minute. <laughs> it's now gone. <laughs> I'll 